Labas. Hello, everyone. Welcome. I will present an alternate version of the load tracing that we have done, the so-called grid of beams that are loaded by only gravity load. However, the difference is that now we will look at loads that are applied to beams or rafters that are inclined. So here we have a wall and we have a series of beams, one next to the other. In the United States, these are called rafters, but they're just beams. Uh, let me show you in uh, three dimensions one more time. So here's the wall that has its own weight. Here are the beams. And then they connect to the other side, which I will show you here using GeoGebra. Something like this, okay? So what I'd like you to do for this project is to design a computer program using GeoGebra that will be flexible enough to carry various loads. And there are two loads that I want you to study. The first is dead load, which is always along the length of the member because it's just dead load. It's just the weight of the member. So as you march along the member, you have a load on that member. If it's shaped like this or shaped like this, it doesn't matter. You're going along the length of the member. So I show that here as being the blue beams and there is a load, but remember it's not force per length, it is force per length squared. And typically that is dead load, okay? So dead load is something that is always there. It's the self weight of the members. It can include other things like mechanical, electrical, plumbing, there's a little bit of extra load, which we call miscellaneous. But for the purposes of this module today, it's just dead load. Then we have live load. And that is not applied along the, mem the length of the member. That is applied on a horizontal plane. On the horizontal plane, see that? So that is projected downwards onto the roof and it's always on the horizontal plane. What I need you to do and what is very important to do, and this may be confusing for the first time you do it, but after you do it, then you will say, oh, I'm glad that we did this. You must change the live load, which is horizontal, and make it on the inclined plane. And then you must take the dead load and put it on the horizontal plane. You need to go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And the way to do that is very straightforward. It's through the slope of the roof. If the roof was horizontal, those two numbers would be the same. If the roof is not horizontal, all you need is a geometric study of the rise and the run and the hypotenuse between those two, and that's it. So the numbers that I have here are United States numbers. In Europe, you should use something else, something that is familiar to you but you can debug your program using these numbers. Then 
we have um, the load of the wall itself. The wall itself must weigh something, of course. That's just dead load. There's no Spider-Man climbing up that wall as live load. Now, there could be horizontal load like wind, but wind does not hit the vertical elements. Wind hits the diaphragm. We talked about that last time. So we don't actually load the walls themselves in this course. We take horizontal loads and we apply a portion of it, half, to the diaphragm. Since the wall weighs something itself, the vertical load at the top of the wall will be less than the vertical load at the bottom of the wall because the bottom of the wall must support the entire wall plus the load at the top of the wall. And what is at the top of the wall? That is these, these loads right here the, from the rafters or from those beams, each one hitting the top of the load, wall like that. Now the rafters have a spacing, of course, but it's just a number and I'll talk about why we need that number. It's usually very tight spacing. And although we have a series of point loads, we pretend that it's actually a uniformly distributed load. And that's a very reasonable assumption. So again, these numbers are not European numbers, they're, they're United States numbers, but there's really three numbers. The first is on the horizontal plane. The second is on the inclined plane. So what does that mean? On this plane, on that or on that inclined plane going up. And then the third is the load of the walls themselves. And your goal is to get this on the foundation, this line load on the foundation. Now, how do we do it? It's just a transformation through the slope of the roof. So I did a number of transformations here for you, and I'd like you to check your program with these numbers. So let's just, don't worry about feet, don't worry about pounds, let's just say length. Let's say the horizontal length, the horizontal length is 14 units of length. We call that the run. How much are you running along? The vertical length is the rise. How much do we go up? The rise over the run. However, there's one unusual thing here. We would do that per foot in the United States, or you would do that per meter in Europe. So you don't give these two numbers, which this base, this run could be 26 or six. You say, what is it per one? And how much does it rise up for a run of one? And that one for us is 12 in the United States, 12 inches, but don't worry about that. It's the slope of the roof. So let's go through it now. Uh, we have a few numbers which are given. And again, there's nothing magic about these numbers. I want you to use numbers that are comfortable for you. You have to change these numbers, but you could use my numbers to check your program. So here I said that horizontal run is 14. And then I said the slope is four over 12. For you, it could be um, three point something over 10 or 
0 0.3 over 1. It's just a ratio of two numbers. Then I need the hypotenuse, which is very quick to find, the square root of the sum of the squares. And then what I get is the following. Let me zoom out a little bit and then you'll see. So what I did here was I changed fours per length squared to fours per length. Fours per length on each one of those individual blue beans. How do I do that? Fours per length squared multiplied by a length gives you a fours per length. Now, what length do I use to multiply by? It's not the span. It's not the rise. It's the spacing of those beams. And you could see that right here. Um, let me just say, if I have a fours per length squared here, I want to retain this value whether I'm going horizontally or inclined. I don't want that value to disappear. So which one do I squish? Which one do I lose? Which dimension disappears? The horizontal dimension because that other dimension remains in place. So I take force per length squared which is an area load, and I squish it, leaving this dimension in place. Here, the spacing is two. It, for you, it'll be something different. Two meters is a very long span, but two feet is like this. So it's maybe a half a meter. You would divide by the spacing. Another way of thinking about that, and this is not the hard part, is half of this width and half of this width go towards that line load. Half on one side, half on the other. So for me, it would be one unit of length on one side, one unit of length on the other side, halfway to the next element. The next element is two units away. So I have one on one side, one on the other side. So my horizontal dimension is two. So I multiply by two and I would multiply this number just directly because that's already horizontal. So if I wanted the horizontal, the, lo the load per length along a horizontal plane, I would take this number and multiply it by two. If I wanted the load per length on the inclined plane, I would take the inclined load and multiply it by two. However, there's a trick here, and this is where it gets a little, maybe a little confusing for people the first time they see it. How do I change the inclined to the horizontal, or how do I change the horizontal to the inclined? So I'll show you how I did it, but let's look at a picture first. So what I did here was I took one of the numbers. Let's take the easy one first. So the easy one is that the dead load is applied as 18 force per length squared on the inclined plane. Multiply that by two and I get 36. It's right here. That's easy. The other one, I have that number already. How do I change that horizontal load to a oh, force per length? Well, I, there's two different ways, but here in this example, what I did was I took the line load per length and I increased it. Now, why did I increase it? Think about that. I have a diagonal, and then I have a horizontal. The horizontal distance is shorter 
than the diagonal distance, shorter than the diagonal distance. So the load must be larger over this shorter path to get the same amount of load along the longer path. So the 36 force per length becomes 37.95 over that shorter path. The 36 along the long path becomes 37.95 along the shorter path for these numbers. And then I'll show you how I did it in um, GeoGebra. Uh, maybe that's a good time to stop. So let's look at the GeoGebra file a little bit now. So you should set up your algebra window using variable names that make sense to you. And remember, everything is parametric. The only thing, and I'm not exaggerating, the only thing that is not parametric is this blue dot here. Everything else is a parameter. That blue dot is at zero, zero, zero. Okay, so let's say I have dead load. Um, I think I called it roof dead load. Here it is. Roof dead load is 18. That is along the length of the member. Dead load is always, always, always a length of the, along the length of the member. I want you to use this number to debug your programs, but then change it to a European unit. The live load is never along the length of the member. It is horizontal. So here I have 30. So now what did I do? I changed roof dead load horizontal. I made the roof dead load horizontal. And how did I do that? I multiplied by the hypotenuse, the long number, and I divided by the run or the or the span, the roof span. So for me, the roof span was 14 and the roof rise was not given. I gave you a slope, a roof slope of uh, four over 12 here, right? So roof slope was four twelfths. For you, it could be something different. Just use four twelfths. So the rise is 4.67. Roof slope times roof span is 4.67. So how do I get the roof dead load horizontal? I take the roof dead load and I multiply it by the long number and divide by the smaller number. I'm increasing that load. And I go the opposite way when I change the horizontal load to an inclined load because I have more length to cover. So I must decrease that load. So I'll show you here. So the roof live load was 30. That's on a horizontal plane. The roof live load incline is the roof live load multiplied by the span, smaller number, divided by the hypotenuse, the longer number. Okay? Okay. And that's really it. Um, that's the hardest part. The rest of it is pretty straightforward, I think. I have a force per length squared marching along these inclinations. How do I make that a force per length marching along the inclination? Force per length squared, how does it become force per length? You multiply by a length. What is the length that disappears? The perpendicular length, not the axial length, but the perpendicular length that disappears. We call that spacing. So here my spacing was two. So roof. Uh, uh, dead load. What did I call that? Uh, dead load 
top of the wall. I'm oh, sorry. Um, I called it. Um, here it is. I called it dead load, um, either inclined or horizontal. So let's do the easy one first. Dead load, inclined, force per length. FPL, you should call that FPL. I called it PLF for pounds of per linear foot, but you can call it FPL, force per length. So what is that? That's the roof dead load, which is a force per length squared multiplied by the spacing. What is the dead load on the horizontal plane, force per length? Really what I did was I, I used the force per length squared on the horizontal plane, and I just multiplied it by the spacing. On the Word document, I did it slightly differently. So I'll share that with you. I changed um, the force per length. I think it's here. Yeah, I changed the force per length of Oops, let me just uh, share the screen here. I changed the force per length, which was on the inclined plane, and I just made it a force per length on the horizontal plane. You could do that, or you could do it the other way. It doesn't matter. So what I'd like you to do is be nimble or acrobatic, and just you should be able to do it Either way, changing horizontal force per length squared to force per length or inclined force per length squared to force per length. Okay, so that was dead load inclined force per length. Remember, that's a given here. Dead load horizontal was a number that I calculated and I multiplied it by the spacing let's do this one live load live load horizontal force per length that's simply the roof live load which is on the horizontal plane multiplied by the spacing the inclined is that second number that force per length squared multiplied by the spacing i think that's hopefully maybe stop the video and watch it one more time. But obviously the only way you could really learn this is by doing it yourself. And that's the, sh the motto of uh, Cal Poly is learn by doing. You really can't learn it fully by just listening to me. Okay, let's go back now to the next picture because I think the next picture is very nice. I hope you're going to like it. So we have these numbers now, whether they're dead load or live load, it doesn't matter. I could have it inclined or horizontal, either way, all, all sorts of permutation. Now I need to get the reaction at the end of the rafter, at the top of the wall, I need to get those numbers here that we talked about. I need to get these point loads at the top of the wall. Now, how do I do that? That is very quick. That is just statics, but there's no horizontal wind load in this problem. It's just gravity. And these are all simply supported. So that means there is no bending moment transferred. It's just a pin connection. So half the load goes to one side and half the load goes to the other side. I think I have a picture of that here. Here in this these numbers. Now there's two ways of doing this, and I do think you should do it two ways. There's, I think it's very helpful. I did it two ways for you in this Word document, and I did it two ways for you in the GeoGebra. 
and they have to match these two different versions. So I called it version one and version two. So let's look at the top number here, this 210. How did I get 210? I have force per length squared on a horizontal plane. How do I make that force per length retaining this dimension or leaving this dimension in place? The other dimension disappears. So how do I do that? I took half of this area load and I squished it to one side. That disappears. The other half goes to the crown of the roof, the very, very highest part of the roof. So half of that load goes here. And that is super fast. Look how fast that is. I knew the horizontal span was 14, so I just have seven. So I take my 30 force per length squared and multiply it by seven, and that's it, 210. For the incline, that's where it's really good to have this number as an area load, force per length squared on the inclined plane. Now, if that's dead load, you have that. If it's live load, you don't have that. You have to find that number. And then I took half of this dimension, not half of 14, but half of this dimension, which is here, or the transformed load, which is inflated and then um, multiplied by seven. So let's see how I did that in GeoGebra. And I call that um, reaction. Let's do the easy one first, the reaction on the rafter which is the length of the rafter that's the hypotenuse multiplied by the live load along that rafter on the inclined plane and I took half of it So that is this point, this line load force per length along the incline multiplied by half of the inclined length. The other way I did it was this. Oops. The live load horizontal force per length, not force per length squared, force per length times the horizontal distance divided by two. And those two numbers are exactly the same. Let's look at the dead load. You have to be able to do this every single way, okay? Let's look at the dead load. The dead load, let's do the easy one first. The dead load is given on the inclined plane as force per length squared. I simply changed it to force per length and then I took one half of the incline length. So it's dead load, force per length, not force per length squared, force per length on the incline plane. And I took half of that hypotenuse. That's version one. The other way of doing it is this. Oops. the dead load on the horizontal plane, which was a transformed equation. But force per length, 
not force per length squared, and one half of the horizontal distance. So you should really do it two ways to really understand the difference between all of these. Just going back and forth, back and forth, horizontal to inclined, inclined to horizontal, force per length squared to force per length. Okay, so then um, I have this reaction of the rafters, dead load, live load, which is the dead load reaction plus the live load reaction. And it doesn't matter whether I used version one or version two because they're identical. So I took the I took the, oops, I took the reaction here from the live load and the reaction here from the dead load, and I just added them up, and I get 685. So let's go back to the Word document. Let's see if we could find 685. And there it is. I did it in a different way here. Uh, I did it as line loads, which you could um, check the way I did it here. Now that is not the line load on the top of the wall. That is simply a reaction. That is a force not a force per length. Here I used pounds force, but you could use kilonewtons. It is not a force per length. So how do I make it a force per length? I divide by a length. And this is the hardest part. Students never understand this. Which length do I use? Um, so let me show you this picture and then maybe it'll make sense. This is the hardest part of the lesson. Let me show it to you here because I think this is okay. Here I have a rafter. The next one is two feet away. The next one is two away. But these are all forces. This is a force. This is a force. This is a force. Let's say it's 685. It doesn't matter what the number is. It's a force. It's not a force per length. And why is the width of this wall not important? This is the hardest part of the lesson. Why is the width of the wall not important? Because I never added up all of these forces and divided by that width. I just never did that. We don't do that. Uh, you could, but it's terribly, terribly tedious. And don't do it you get a point load from some spacing. It has nothing to do with the wall. It has to do with the spacing of the rafters. The wall could just keep going, like one of your big box stores at a mall, like Ikea or something. The wall could just keep going and going and going and going, but I have a series of point loads. How do I change a series of point loads to force per length? And again, this is the hardest part of the lesson. I divide by the length. And the only length that's left is that spacing. That is the hardest part of the lesson. Okay, so let me show it to you how I did it in GeoGebra. So I said, this was the reaction. This is a force, not a force per length. It combined dead load and live load, but it is not a force per length. It is a force. This one is force per length along the top of the wall. So I divide by the spacing. So the width of this wall is completely, it never comes into the equations. It's completely irrelevant. 
I just made up a number. I made the width of the wall. Uh, I just made the width of the wall some fraction of the span. It's it's a silly number. It doesn't matter at all. There's nothing. There's nothing. This wall just doesn't matter at all, right? Doesn't matter at all. Which seems weird, right? That's why I said it's the hardest problem. It's the hardest problem in this exercise, but it's actually hard because it seems like it should be important, but the width, the width of the wall is completely unimportant. Oops. Okay. Um, so now we're at the last spot here. So I'll stop this share. Let's go to the, and the rest of it, I think is very, very straightforward. I have a force per length here, but I need the force per length here. So how do I do that? I take the force per, oops, let me, sorry, I, I'm not sharing my screen. I have the force per length here, but I need the force per length at the bottom. How do I do that? I take the force per length at the top and I take the pounds per, the force per length squared, and I just change that to a force per length. That dimension gets squished. It disappears. The only one that remains is the horizontal dimension. So all I did was I just multiplied by the height of the wall. So I have the force per length of the wall multiplied, force per length of the wall multiplied by um, the, the area of the wall. Um, you could do it that way, or you could do it um, multiplied by the um, force per length squared multiplied by that length, which is the entire wall, the 24 foot or the 24 unit length of wall here. All right, there's a little poster at the bottom here. Um, um, so take this wall get the weight of the wall and apply it as a line load at the bottom. So let's go back to our prompt now for the final uh, part of the lesson here. So here's your project. Uh, create a wall of some height. The width does not really matter. Uh, create some rafters or some inclined beams. You don't have to use that word rafters. You don't have to reflect it about the crown, but there's a really nice reflect button in GeoGebra. Um, so I'll show you that really quick. Um, I uh, just created this plane here. You could see this plane. Let me just delete this line and then you'll see what I did here. It's really fast. I just did, did this button here, reflect about the plane. So it's the third from the right, reflect about a plane. Select the object to reflect, then the plane of reflection. There's the object and there's the plane, that's it. There's the object, there's the plane, and it just reflects like a mirror. So that was kind of nice. You don't have to do that, but I liked it. So here's your project, create a wall of some height. The width does not really matter. Make something up. Create these inclined beams. Then assume some live load on the roof. That is always, always, always on the horizontal plane. Assume some dead load on the roof. That is always, always, always on the inclined plane. Assume some dead load of the wall. That's force per length squared. Now, you could use my United States values here, but I do want you to apply different numbers, typical European numbers. You could just make something up. And then I want you to clearly show me everything that we just talked about. Give me the dead load 
as horizontal per length squared. Length squared, right? Length squared. You're giving it to it as hor inclined force per length squared. I want it as horizontal. Then clearly state the live load per inclined length squared. You're giving it as horizontal, switch it to the inclined. Clearly show the line load at the top of the wall. That is the reactions of the beams divided by the spacing. You could check your work using that other method, but it, it's, you don't have to. Clearly state the line load at the bottom of the wall. That's the foundation of your whole building. So notice what we've done. We've noticed, we've mapped or tracked how the load flows through the building. That's the whole point of this course. How does load flow through a building? Then, of course, put it all into a single PDF, no Google Docs, no Excel sheets, snip things out. If you have to write something by hand, write it by hand, but you really don't have to write anything by hand. Show me the work. You could show me like by highlighting your GeoGebra. Uh, upload one PDF, but that PDF must have multiple scenarios where you've changed the length of the building span the rise, you've maybe changed the load, you've changed the height of the wall, the width of the wall doesn't matter. That does not have to change. And of course, be proud of your work um, because I want to show your work to everybody. So I want you to be proud of it. And that's it. Um, so I hope you can watch this video maybe a few times and then ask questions if you have any. And you know, you must have fun. Okay, have fun. Okay, good luck. Bye-bye.